Hi everyone, welcome to this workshop 6.3. I see many of you joining. Let's give a few seconds. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you are probably in the conference portal. So what I would like to ask you is to please click on the launch Zoom app, which is under the window uh, presentation and then minimize the Zoom window and go back to the virtual portal. In this way, you can um, click on back to timeline on the right left part so that you won't have sound interference. The link, um, just saying it again, the link to the um, Zoom, you can find it under the window um, where you are seeing this presentation. This way we can chat uh, through the chat and interact. Um, so I invite you all to go there and then um, go back to the conference portal, click on back to timeline to avoid interference with sound. Great. I see a few more people are joining. Uh, meanwhile, I will give a brief introduction so that everyone can start from the same point. Um, so I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, I trust everyone sees the presentation. So again, welcome everyone to workshop 6.3. I'm your moderator uh, for this panel. I'm Grazia Bassazin, Program Manager at QTEC uh, at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands and also part of the coordination and support action uh, QTEDU team. So before we dive in this workshop, I want to remind you to all the appointments uh, of education in quantum technology today. So we have our workshop now, um, then there will be Federica Alicia Beduini with um, a game, an interactive tool to introduce quantum technologies. And then in the afternoon, uh, Jacob Sherson will moderate uh, an invited talks, invited talks and panel discussion on education in quantum technologies. So what's the agenda for uh, this workshop? Uh, we will have four talks. Um, by our speakers, then a Q&A session, a community discussion, and we will have some time for community input towards our European roadmap to quantum awareness. And finally, a closing summary by the QTEDU team uh, about the future of quantum technology education uh, in Europe. So let me start uh, to give a little bit of background about QTEDU for the ones um, who didn't know it yet. So everything started from the strategic research agenda where some needs were highlighted. There was a need to create an ecosystem in Europe of a skilled quantum workforce. Um, there was a need to work against a shortage of quantum experts and to create, have, uh, create a well-informed uh, society that would be able in the future to um, accept the quantum technologies. And the need to work on those uh, lines was um, very clear for uni uh, university education, uh, industry workforce, high school, and the general public in, in general. So outreach, right? And overall, there was a need of creating a synergy between academic researcher, education experts, and industrial partners. So along those lines came uh, QTEDU CSA, um, running for two years now, one year has passed already. Um, and our action lines are uh, mainly four, community building and support of the community, scale up quantum education in Europe uh, through pilot programs, have a common language, establish a common language for quantum technology competencies and skills, and collecting and sharing resources. So I will briefly go through the four of them and then we will start with the talks. So first action line, building the quantum education community, we have done so through the creation of five working groups. Uh, it's a very large community 
uh, of 325 members coming from 36 countries. And every working group um, discussed topics about a certain um, target audience, of course, that we um, mentioned before, so higher education, primary school, and so on. Uh, pilot projects, we uh, have the creation of um, pilot programs. Each pilot program is targeting a certain audience again. Um, at the moment, 11 pilots are running with 129 members coming from 25 uh, different countries. So very exciting. And today, um, the pilot of industry initiatives will be uh, presented by his uh, coordinator, Andras Pei. The third line of action was the creation of a common language uh, for quantum technology. And this is the competence framework uh, that was published. And you can also find it um, through the QR code. And finally, um, the creation of infrastructure, an online repository for resources at different levels. So it could be internships, so just database, um, outreach material, education programs, uh, and so on. And you can also find that through the QR code here, and you can also submit um, your data, sorry, your materials. Okay, uh, I would say let's uh, go to the talks. Um, just so you know, you can always uh, write your questions on the chat or raise your hands as well. There will be time for questions at the end of all the talks, but if you want to just Fire a question uh, in the meanwhile, if you have time, we can uh, take it. So first uh, invited speaker, uh, Araceli Venegas Gomez, um, with the talk, uh, Quantum Technologies Training Initiatives Worldwide in the Present and Future. So in this talk, Araceli will describe the quantum workforce bottleneck and will provide an overview of the different initiatives uh, regarding education for quantum technology around the world, from primary school to industry training. Araceli is the founder and CEO of Cureka, Quantum Resources and Careers, an online platform for quantum training and resourcing to support individuals and businesses to be part of the quantum revolution. So Araceli, thank you. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Gatia. Okay. I hope you can hear me and see the, the slides. So yeah, I just wanted to provide a little bit of, um, you know, an overview to start a discussion today. Um, in any case, if you have any particular question for anything specific, happy to discuss afterwards or just uh, put it in the chat as Gratia mentioned. So when we think about the ecosystem, you know, everybody's talking about the ecosystem. We talk about the scientists, people in academia, people working on the fundamental science, we also talk about industry, so we, we are counting on industry, the quantum startups, but also the end users. We have the government, the people putting the money onto the science to create this industry, and we also have the general public. This is kind of the whole ecosystem. What is the quantum ecosystem? Well, if we think about why this ecosystem is different from any other when we talk about emerging technologies, it's because quantum mechanics is not something that you actually study at school, right? It's, it's something that either you study at the university, you might have some notations in high school, but in general, there's nothing that is, is like, is in your syllabus, is in your program, and you need to know quantum mechanics. And quantum has this connotation that people either think that it's very hard or it's uh, just so difficult and so cool that they want to go involved, but they don't understand. So what is really important here is that this is, the main differentiation from any other ecosystem. And what to actually understand why we are talking about these new technologies, that is quantum technologies, the thing is, yes, we need some notations of quantum mechanics. It's not that everyone who is involved in quantum should know, you know, all the foundations of uh, quantum physics and everything that, like all the fundamentals and uh, the mathematical language, but something, understand the fundamental physical phenomena, for example. This is the main difference here. And the truth is that we know that we need to educate this workforce, the, the present workforce and the future one. 
And in order to be able to do that, we need to think that even though quantum technologies are not yet as a whole in our society, it's going to be coming you know, progressively in the next decades, we need to think about how to have this workforce ready for that. And we need to change before the actual you know, big change in societal change and disruptive change of quantum technologies will come. And also, probably you know that implementing something new regarding an academic discipline, an academic syllabus and program takes time. So it's not something that can be done in one year. That's why we are all starting the discussion now. So if we think about the quantum education system, this is taken from, from US, but in general it's pretty similar everywhere. It's hard to find one education system for all countries in the world. But you know, you have nursery, um, primary education. Of course, you, you don't expect very little children to learn about quantum mechanics uh, at school. But yeah, one of the things that we can do is a lot of outreach activities. We can start introducing phenomena like um, the concept of light, uh, a wave and, and particle. So very kind of a easy concepts that they kind of start thinking about it, it start resonating for them. That's the only thing that we can do at that level. Now, if we go to high school and just before going to university, I think really the only thing that we can do at the moment is to involve the teachers. We cannot expect that in the whole Europe, in the whole world, it's going to be a completely new program that is going to be implemented in all high schools. But what we can do is to organize different activities where we teach the teachers these concepts of foundational, uh, very basic concepts of quantum mechanics and technologies that they can then teach to the pupils. It's the only way. If the teachers are not aware of what is coming in terms of these new emerging technologies, we cannot expect that this, the, the students can, can be involved. And then if we go to university level, so far in the last years, it was like, if you want to be part of this new emerging quantum market, you need to study physics. But we know that nowadays it's really about engineering, it's chemistry, it's uh, computer science, it's mathematics. So it's really about embedding this concept of quantum technologies within all these different undergraduate programs, which is something that we are discussing um, around the world a lot, but again, it takes time. And then, of course, if we, talk, if we go to the last levels of education, we have specific master programs in quantum technologies and quantum science. And then we have specific PhDs, doctors that have been, as usual, focus on something very, very specific. It could be um, working together with industry for very uh, applied science, or it could be a CDT. This is a, where you have kind of an integrated master program where you have one year lessons, one year masters, and then you have uh, three or four years of PhD. So this is kind of the whole and system on how we can think of quantum technologies in kind of a, how we could embed it in the system. So right now, there are a lot of masters on quantum technologies. And I want to correct one thing, it's not just quantum technologies, it's masters about quantum um, notions, it's uh, quantum information science, it's quantum computing, it's quantum engineering. And I think all these masters are going to go really into the direction of all being quantum engineering, because we know that this is, I think, the new kind of a field that is going to emerge again progressively. But you see, the important thing here is that there are a lot of different masters around the world. And I think this is a very, very important message that is uh, really global. And every year there are new masters. Whether all masters are really, uh, let's say, whether all masters focus on what we really need in terms of skills for quantum technologies, that's another question and something that we could discuss later on. And I wanted just to give you um, a kind of overview of other educational resources, and I say others because we are not talking here about um, really programs at university. So it could be any kind of resources, and you think that, well, you can have some YouTube video, but there are so many things, and that's really, really important for you to know. This is just a snapshot. This is not exhaustive, but this is just a snapshot of what is happening in Europe. And if you go to the QTA2 database in the flagship website, you, you have this list where you can see what are these different resources. And what is even more important, if you have, as Grazia mentioned, if you have another resources that is not there, you can always add it. So we are kind of building all this educational database of resources available in quantum education, which is, I think, very, very important. 
And I wanted to kind of show you some others that are not part of this European database. And there are a lot of things going on in the world. I cannot put everything here, but I just wanted to kind of put some um, just to explain and to show you the, what is going on. So we know that in Canada, well, the, the Institute for Quantum Computing has been there for more than a decade and they are doing really amazing work. But I think on, in terms of outreach, and they had uh, they hosted the, uh, a quantum exhibition at the at the science museum. They really have a, a lot of different ideas of how to bring these concepts to young children. And I think we could learn from you know lessons learned. We can just uh, talk to them and see what they have done. That we can maybe incorporate some of these ideas in Europe. In US, uh, IEEE Quantum they have kind of a workshop every month or so where they bring people from all over the world presenting what they are doing. They kind of have very specific workshops in the IEEE Quantum Week every year, and they are doing a lot of different activities on that. I think it's the very worst that if you want to know more, that's just uh, type it in, in your Google browser and, and you will see what is what they are doing. And then Qubit for Qubit, this is a nonprofit organization and they target high school scholars. So they, they kind of bring the notion quantum computing uh, mainly um, to, to the students. Then in Latin America, there are a lot of things going on. Um, we have Quantum Hispano, this is a community of people, um, mainly students and people coming from computer science that want to know more about quantum computing. Um, the Unconventional Quantum Computing Lab in Mexico, they kind of have a, a YouTube and also I think um, they are trying to create now another kind of course where they focus on some specific algorithms in quantum computing. And then you have Brazil Quantum. This is the, the first community done by students, for students, where they explain notions of quantum computing again in and here in Portuguese. If we go to India, they have Quantum Computing India. This is a massive network of people where it's mentor the mentors. So you have people learning about quantum computing. They will mentor all the people and these people will, it's like a chain of creating people with notions in quantum computing. I'm not saying people ready to be part of the quantum workforce, but they have the specific notions to be part of this um, kind of ecosystem of individuals who know uh, the basis of quantum computing. And then in, in Australia, you have the Sydney Quantum Academy. They had a an event that unfortunately was cancelled and, and it's moved to 2022, but they are doing a lot of things uh, also to bring this ecosystem to, to the community in, in Australia. And Quantum Control, they just created an, a course with kind of a basic notions of quantum mechanics. Then we have Strangeworks, we have QBraid, we have a lot of different resources. So just to give you this general overview, I put here, again, this is not exhaustive, but here you have a lot of different events uh, and resources and companies working on quantum education. So when, when I talk about general resources, we are talking about either societies or companies um, that are doing different things. They are creating um, specific content, uh, educational content. They are also organizing workshops, events. And examples is, of course, QWall, if, if you're familiar, they are doing fantastic work, not only in Europe, but all, all over the world. Um, of course, if we talk about workshops and events, you are all familiar with the Kiskit Global Summer School. I think last year or this year, there were 5,000 people trained in, in the Kiskit platform. Um, we are here in AQTC 2021, where, of course, we're also learning. Um, then I think when we talk about games, it's really it's something that a lot of people um, don't have in the first glance when they talk about resources, but there are very interesting things out there. And quantum chess, I think, is one of the most famous uh, where people play chess uh, with notions of quantum mechanics. And when we talk about online courses, you have courses from academia, uh, of course, in Coursera, EDX. Um, you are familiar with probably the MIT course. And at Cureca, we have uh, specific courses where we partner with, um, with different institutions and, and industry. So you see, there is really a big um, overview. This is really a, this overview. And there are a lot of different resources. You just need to know where to find them. So everybody's talking about the quantum workforce. And I know that I am going to be a little bit late on the talk, but 
hopefully it's okay. But why everybody started to talk about this workforce is because actually they realized that they don't find the people with the right skills. It's a bottleneck that is already happening now. So what we did was uh, to kind of estimate this job market at the moment and how this is going to be evolving in the next decades. And we see that it's going to be exponential. Most of the people who are going to take these quantum jobs in the future are people who are now, again, in primary school, high school. So we go back to outreach activities and teach the teachers. But we also have a new market of, of different startups that need workforce at the moment. And here, just as for you to have this overview, there are startups all over the world. And some of them, they struggle. They struggle to find people with the right skills because the workforce is not ready. The pool of candidates is very, very small. And because the skills are very specific, again, we are in the phase, still we are in the fundamental science, in the basic science research phase for this emerging market. So we need a lot of people with very um, specific experience. We need people that have been working in industry, but also understand quantum, and there are not so many. So if you're curious, just a little bit, an overview of all the countries where you find um, startup companies, and I think this is really, really good for you to understand, is everywhere, it's in a lot of different countries, and this is really a global community, so we need to work together, we need to coordinate activities, and I think that's why it's very important that we discuss uh, how we can do that in order to create the, the workforce. So just some words of what we are doing, so why I'm presenting this and what we are doing at, at Cureca. This ecosystem that I mentioned before, well, it's, there is a clear gap between these different stakeholders, right? It's, if you think about the academia and the final user, then user, the, the industry, you know, there is kind of a language problem. So Kureka born really was with this idea of creating a common language to make everyone ready for quantum and to create value. We want everyone to create impact with quantum technologies. And at the end, we want to create business. So where are we in our focus on, on education? We are doing some outreach activities. Um, I can give you more information if you, if you want to know, but we are really focusing on the last level of education. So we want to prepare the workforce just when they are jumping into a job. So the people finishing their masters, the PhDs, or people already in industry that want to go and um, pivot into a job in the quantum market. And for that, we have uh, our own platform where we provide training and resourcing. We work with individuals all over the world who are looking for a job in quantum, but we also work with a lot of companies looking for those individuals. So if you're looking for a job or if you're looking to hire individuals, please come back to us. Um, just a little bit overview of what we are doing. Again, I mentioned that we have our online platform. We have an introductory course for, you know, no formulas, no technical at all. And now what we are doing is kind of a focusing on different sectors. And we have quantum computing for finance, two different courses, and we are going to launch um, courses with some very um, known companies and also um, in some specific languages like uh, Portuguese and Japanese and Spanish. Um, and again, uh, we also work a lot on community building. We organize career events and our famous uh, Quantum Latino event, which was really successful. Um, yeah, we want everyone to be ready and be part of this quantum workforce. So I think that's all, um, not too late. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Araceli. Thank you. Um, if you already have questions, everyone, you can um, write them in the chat. Um, meanwhile, we will go ahead uh, with our next speaker, Andras Pei. Uh, Andras will talk about Quantum Retraining Network, QAREER, a QT Edu pilot project for industry workforce retraining in quantum uh, technologies. And Andres is the contact person of uh, the pilot. He will uh, tell us all about it. And Andres is associate professor at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics in Hungary and founder of Hamilton Consulting, an enterprise, enterprise for education, consulting, and research in quantum science and technology. Andres, the floor is yours. Thank you, Grazia. Uh, can you see my shared screen? Yes. 
Good, thanks. Indeed, um, thank you for the opportunity to give this talk here. My name is Andras Pai. Um, I work at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics in Hungary and also in this particular pilot I'm representing our own uh, um, small scale enterprise, small scale enterprise uh, Hamilton Consulting. So I'm going to talk about CARRIER, so the, yeah, my proposed pronunciation of, of this uh, acronym is CARRIER, uh, which is the Industry Workforce Retraining Pilot of uh, QT Edu. And uh, the starting point is, uh, is simple and, and pretty much linked to the previous talk from Arateli. Um, so the starting point is that um, in today's uh, highly skilled uh, workforce, um, the vast majority of this workforce has no uh, uh, quantum skills at all. And um, we think that naturally work workforce retraining is uh, the way to make this uh, human resource available for, for the quantum ecosystem. So in the talk, um, I will briefly introduce uh, the pilot, the partners and the activities uh, running within CARRIER. Um, and then I will also invite uh, all the interested parties to join our efforts. Um, so um, this is the um, consortium which we have now in CARRIER. So this is 16 uh, organizations. These organizations include uh, universities, for example, University of Strasbourg is here. It includes um, companies providing education, for example, Eureka or Algorithmic. It also includes non-profit organizations like QWORD, uh, shown here, and also uh, potential industry and users such as Nokia or uh, manufacturing, quantum computing manufacturer startups like IQM. And um, in principle, this serves as a network. There is no single holy grail target of the, of the, of the pilot. Instead, we have uh, multiple collaborative projects. And I'm going to showcase some of them um, um, in the rest of the talk. So the first one, uh, project number one of the career pilot um, is called entitled Quantum Eastern Europe. This is going to be a two-day online event uh, with the goal of building or strengthening the quantum ec ecosystem in Eastern Europe. So you, you see the graph geographical locations where, where we are targeting um, this event here. Um, this is done in collaboration of these partners um, and there's already a preliminary website which you can check uh, quantumeasterneurope.com. Of course, it makes sense to, to check back uh, in a few weeks when we have more information about it there. Um, a second project, uh, project number two in Carrier, is actually an event which was already uh, held. So this was called the Budapest Quantum Computing Meetup. And as you see, this uh, happened uh, one week ago. Uh, this was a collaboration of these organizations so, uh, shown on the right. And here we invited uh, young experts, uh, uh, young Hungarian experts working at uh, quantum technology companies um, like IQM, Amazon, uh, Google, or Xanadu, um, in order to you know, try to build bridges between uh, the already uh, thriving quantum ecosystem uh, in Western Europe or in the US and the Hungarian quantum ecosystem, which is, which is just uh, starting to being built up. Uh, so that was the main purpose of this, of this uh, meetup event. Um, the third um, activity I'd like to um, advertise is an upcoming um, um, uh, industry training event. So this is called Quantum Computing for Chemistry, the next revolution. So it's going to be an in-person industry training event co-organized by uh, the company Kunasis and the University of Strasbourg. It's going to happen in Strasbourg on the week of uh, May 16. Um, and the goal here is to, to attract uh, um, individuals who are working mostly for uh, the chemistry, the chemical industry and the pharmaceutical industry uh, with the goal of you know, providing training in, in, in this field, quantum computing for chemistry. So they, these individuals who join this, uh, uh, this uh, training, they will be able to learn the foundations of, of quantum computing, uh, look at uh, industrially relevant use cases, um, and also have uh, hands-on experience, uh, hands-on training in, in, in actually coding uh, quantum uh, programs. Um, the uh, project number five I'd like to showcase, uh, we call this educational tool develop development. So here within the, the, the pilot consortium, there are a number of organizations who have expertise and already like products or results in terms of um, education tools. So these tools are usually uh, computer programs which facilitate the understanding of, of quantum mechanical con concepts, but they do this in, in terms of like very interactive, playful, intuitive, and visual uh, interfaces. 
Um, and uh, there are already pre-existing uh, tools uh, used mainly at uh, uh, education at a younger age, primary school, high school, university. But now the next step uh, for these tools is, is um, to try to gather input from, from industrial end users about their quantum related training needs. Um, and within the pilot um, activity, uh, the goal is to adapt these already existing ed educational tools to meet these new needs uh, of, the, of the quantum industry. And, and of course, also to test newly developed features uh, with the target group workshops. Um, and the last thing I'd like to showcase is project number six within Carrier. So this is uh, called Carrier Community Meetup. This is going to be a monthly webinar series focusing on quantum technology industry workforce retraining. It's going to start in January. Um, there's already a preliminary website here. Um, but of course, this, there's going to be more and more information uh, uploaded when, when the organization uh, gets in a more advanced uh, stage. So this is a collaboration uh, among these partners of the pilot. Um, and so finally, I'd like to emphasize that um, we are looking for further partnerships. So, already, so even though this pilot is already formalized and running with a well-defined uh, set of consortium partners, uh, we, we, we are aware of the fact that the, the quantum ecosystem and the part of the ecosystem which might be interested in taking part of, of, uh, of uh, you know, commonly organizing these uh, uh, workforce retraining activities is much bigger than, than our consortium. So um, we'd like to you know, make uh, these efforts more streamlined, more efficient. So we want to um, avoid re reinventing a wheel. Um, so if you are, um, an you, you are an organization who is interested in, in, in quantum technology related workforce retraining, for example, an industry end user or a, a quantum technology startup or an education provider, um, and you'd like to join our activities or propose new, new activities, then I invite you to uh, contact us. For example, you can reach out by this uh, email you see here. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Andreas. Um, again, any question can be placed in the chat. And meanwhile, we can go ahead uh, with our third speaker. So our third um, speaker is Alex Holleitner. Uh, he will talk about quantum education in Munich from university to industry. And in his talk, Alex will present essentials of both the master program on quantum science and technology and the QL3 project quantum lifelong learning where specialists and executives from industry are educated in quantum technologies. Alex is professor of physics at the Technical University of Munich and is also director of the Walter Scottke Institute and the Center of Nanotechnology and Nanomaterials of Technical University of Munich. Alex, I see that you have shared your presentation already and so the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chris, here for the nice words and also introduction. Thank you for giving us uh, the possibility to present our work from Munich here in this um, conference. And I appreciate that very much because actually I picked up already a lot of inspirations during the last days. And now I would like to uh, give you insights what we do here. It's, on one hand, it's like an advertisement for collaborations, for example, but also I would like to give you insights um, of what we have experienced already. So um, I speak in my name, of course, but also in the name of Jan van Delft and Tatjana Wilk, who are equally respons um, responsible for these programs. Everything is financed by, on one hand, the Munich Quantum Valley, which is a um, funding from the state of Bavaria, then the MCQ Steeds and Excellence Cluster of the DFG. And then last but not least, we have the Federal Ministry of Science and Education of Germany for the project QL3. We heard it in the first talk by Araceli, which I really enjoyed a lot. We want to go to this or want to achieve the quantum workforce and no one knows how this exactly works for the specific companies. In, in easy terms, you have two accesses. Um, the one is to educate young adults at the university. I will come back to that. The other one is, of course, to introduce experts and executives from industry to the concepts of quantum technologies applied and projected to their specific needs of the company. And of course, there are many more aspects, as we already heard, education of high schools and um, general outreach and so forth. And I leave that out for the moment. Um, instead, I just want to show you what we have done here. So 
Um, we have established a master program on quantum science and technology in Munich. Um, this is a jointly offered um, master program between the LMU and the TU Munich. Um, as it was initiated by this excellence cluster, the Munich Center for Quantum Science and Technology, and it's already running. It's a two-year program. We have now two um, cohorts um, in the system already. And when we started that, Jan van Delft and I, we are, are responsible for the aptitude tests and aptitude uh, procedures. Of course, we do want to include um, Bachelor of Sciences from physics, electrical engineering, computer sciences, chemistry, mathematics, and more. And when you do so, um, so you start to think about what is the what are the essentials to accept um, students from the different disciplines. After long discussions, we decided that uh, to enter this program, it must be quantum mechanics one as a general course, as it's taught worldwide, I think, um, in the Bachelor of Physics. And, and then afterwards, we thought about to balance the different um, abilities, for exa example, from, um, of students from chemistry and mathematics. And we made up an aptitude list basically with points. You can find that online if you go either to this one or to the TUM side where we list all that. It does work quite nicely, I have to say. So we have accepted already chemists, mathematicians, and so forth in the system. But um, you really have to look individually at the applicant's CV and their knowledge um, in order to get there. Because what we already see now, um, you have an, a very incoherent cohort in there. Mm -hmm. And so um, ranging from um, basically really already experts, little experts, let's say, in mathematics and also the uh, framework like tensor networks and so forth, and then to other people who do not know the basics of linear algebra. And this um, particularly applies if you accept and what you want, it, um, that you have worldwide talents in your program. Um, you have to look in detail into the programs. You have to look in detail into the bachelor programs, what I meant, where, uh, where they come from, uh, what kind of uh, courses have they have heard. You need to build up this um, knowledge in your own structure. I mean, in the own university, in this case, it's Jan and me, but also we have um, employees helping us there that we build up a database, how we can make a coherent cohort out of that. There's a gender inequality, I can tell you, my dear colleagues. Um, what we see is now uh, in this uh, master program, quantum science and technology, we are below 10% um, uh, females. And uh, we hope that we can increase that. But in my personal um, experience, I'm father of uh, two kids and uh, one girl, and she's now in the middle um, class of high school. And I see it's, it starts in the seventh class in Germany. Um, when mathematics starts to become a little bit more complicated, and then the girls, they have other attractions, let's say, um, and they don't concentrate so much. And this gap starts. And I think um, this is also a little bit of an idea in this workshop um, for the experts in the audience um, that we should really look into this, um, into the kids uh, age of about 12 to 14, where this gender inequalities starts to happen. And I agree, it depends very much on the teacher, um, how good he or she teaches physics in this case. What we find um, that uh, there's also a separation in the cohorts where you have a lot of students who totally focus on quantum information theory. And especially they um, want to know everything about the theoretical concepts. And the, you have a lot of very good mathematically oriented students in this cohort. And then on the other hand, you have uh, people working on uh, quantum hardware, as we call it, um, who want to know the NB center, how, to, how does it work, how can you build a quantum sensor out of that. Um, we came up with the idea that we have two essential courses, mandatory courses at the first um, semester, one on quantum information theory, the second one on quantum hardware, and then in the second semester, we um, provide very specialized courses on very hot topics um, such that basically both cohorts um, can go into the uh, current state of um, um, where we, uh, of science. What we also see, it's very important to include practical trainings. And there's also the aspect, and these are really uh, expensive um, trainings um, within the university, because if you build up photo entanglement uh, microscopes or in these center microscopes, they're expensive. I can give you the feedback from our students is already that uh, basically 
um, they do want to see quantum entanglement. I mean, uh, we all uh, called it the second quantum revolution and the students which enter now the programs, they come back to us and say, okay, we want to see it. We, we don't want to see another, let's say, uh, advanced practical training on the integer quantum Hall effect or the quantum spin Hall effect. No, they do want to see all these single photon, um, let's say statistics and underlying mathematics. Um, when you do that, of course, as we speak here, um, you want to include the international uh, exchanges and we come up with the measures here. But the problem is, and this is a little bit my impression from the first two years now what we have, I mean, um, the uh, education comes first and then you have the, uh, the exchanges afterwards. And you need to make sure in your programs that really you teach the fundamentals such that they really become experts and not only talk about experts about some something which they do not uh, understand correctly in, in in future and by that that is what i say by to form quantum technology scientists um all of our students they do a master pro uh, project of about one year either in the chairs um, at our institutes or in, in munich or what um or what the munich area or in theory groups and, um, and based on that, we also have already running a credit school based on that, um, for example, in Max Planck credit school we have now, and we will extend these um, activities in here. If you look at this, this is very generic to all programs. Um, when you set it up to a topic which is hot at the moment you set it up. What is now special comes uh, into play when you think about the quantum workforce. And this is, um, we implemented industrial internships now. That is my um, duty, what I'm setting up. Um, and now comes, again, it's not mandatory in the courses because I still believe that the education comes first, but on a voluntary base, they can do um, internships at the companies. And this is financed now by this Munich Quantum Valley. You see the involved companies here in Munich, but we accept many more. And um, so what we are, uh, what I believe is basically that these students, once they have educated in a very fundamental way, they need to get into the companies and need to learn what's going on really there. And also here you see in the cohort of the students, um, let's say 20%, they really want to um, learn what the companies are about to do in uh, quantum technologies. And of course, we're running a little bit into this uh, funnel of IBM um, and Google and um, Amazon because they have uh, these platforms already running. But uh, when you think about, for example, OHB in Germany, you talk about satellite communication, it's totally different. Um, it's not only quantum computing, but we need to teach these students in a way that they have the broad aspects of quantum technologies. And now comes the other interactions, what we have. We are doing all this within this uh, large project, Muni Quantum Valley. Um, we educate the QST students who want to get uh, this information in entrepreneurial aspects and such that they may um, start um, startups and then of course we need to implement them in the small and medium-sized companies i want to mention in this courtroom here for example qtra iqm is a little bit um, larger it's already medium-sized it's it was already mentioned beforehand um, and we're in contact with these companies and that that we fought, um, that we funnel um, the students into these um, internships but at the same time that we give opportunities for the companies to stay in, in the ecosystem close to the university in our case. And this now comes to the next um, part, what I want to present. When you, when you think about how can we um, teach experts from the um, industry in there, we come up with this program, Quantum Lifelong Learning. So basically there will be extra courses for executives in the evening, on the weekends, or also in blocks um, where they can get taught in quantum technology and again there we have um, on one hand uh, that we have to teach the fundamentals so um, what is quantum physics we heard we hear that all over the time from the ceos and the ctos that we need to teach that on the other hand each um, company has a specific interest so we need to serve the interests here and so the projection is totally different this is funded by the federal ministry of science in um, germany and then by that project, we want to also transport the essentials. And um, what I mean by that is uh, when these executives from the industry come into the courses, they need to understand what is this measurement principle? Why do we need to integrate such a long time? Or what is the, the short noise contribution? What is um, 
how does it work to build a quantum sensor? Um, how stable do the framework needs to be? And this is what I um, call the essentials, what we need to do. And I personally uh, totally uh, pers um, have the impression that we need to teach them in a practical way that they really see it. They don't want to watch another YouTube video or something. They really want to see the experimental setup and say, okay, this is how it works. And if I touch this mirror, it doesn't work anymore. They need to get this haptic impression, what I call it. And by that, to trigger the quantum heurica. Um, you need to have one individual in each company who is totally, who has this idea, okay, for our company, we could benefit from this quantum technology in order to have a product um, which is related to, let's say, semiconducting companies or car companies and so forth. Um, what I would like to share here as well is that this effort, what we are putting up is not only my effort. And this is also my impression. We have to, you have to interlink and again, entangle each other. And um, as I said before, um, all these projects are uh, nicely organized together, together with Jan and Tatjana here, but it relies on many more people in the background. First of all, we have Christian Buck and um, Martin Brandt here. Christian was very important for us and is very important because when you come up with master programs, if it's an international one, you always have to go to the legal, um, uh, let's say, frameworks of each university, of each state, of each uh, country. And it's very tricky. And so Christian is a very experienced dean, former dean. And so he knows, he knew all that and he helped us a lot. Martin, for example, um, is just um, developing advanced practical trainings for us. And so you need uh, persons like him, an experienced professor who knows how to set up things, how much it costs and so forth, what you can do. Everything relies on um, the uh, success of our excellence cluster, the Munich Center of Quantum Science. And here we have Emmanuel Bloch, Rudolf Groß and Ignacio Sirak, the spokesperson. And without their impact and also vision, um, you have to uh, basically get the political setting of the ecosystem right in order to get all people on one table. Ignacio, um, I would like to highlight in particular because he and Monica Eidelsburger, they are the first um, lecturers of the mandatory courses. So Ignacio is giving um, now for the second time this quantum information theory mandatory course and Monica is um, setting up and has taught already the quantum hardware course. And I'm very happy. Uh, it's, always, it's always a great joy to discuss with her because she comes from um, atom physics and I'm a semiconductor person or let's say a solid state a quantum person. And hereby we have the different interdisciplinary uh, approaches even within physics. I would like to mention that Rainer Blatt um, now is the director of this Munich Quantum Valley. I'm very happy that he comes here, not only that he started this AQT um, startup, but also with his um, visionary um, approach to uh, how you form such an ecosystem. Um, and uh, you, he pushes all the barriers and thresholds what we have from politics. I would also um, like to mention Florian Marquardt from Erlangen here from the Max Planck Institute because he, together with Jan, are setting up the credit school, what I uh, mentioned before, and uh, by that, they are very essential. Last but not least, two seconds more, we have Bernhard Kraus from the TUM, Institute of Lifelong Learning, where they have a lot of experiences with companies, how to interact with them, how to get the feedback, what they need. And last but not least, um, Jochen Kuhn is joining us now at the LMU, um, and he's helping us with the didactic um, concepts of this project. To form, the quantum workforce in Munich. And this is basically the quantum education from university to industry. Thank you very much for your attendance. And I think I'm still in time. Sorry for a, bit, bit, a little bit too long. <laughs> no, no, Alex, thank you for the presentation. You are absolutely on time. And yes, I've seen uh, many questions coming up already. I would say let's keep them um, for the Q&A session. Um, and I will introduce um, our last speaker. So, sorry. Yeah, now it's working. So, Anand Sharma uh, will talk about digitalized platform for internationalization, master study track in quantum technology. And in his talk, Anand will present the mobility system uh, cooperation in higher education, uh, my score project at Aachen University. Um, responsible for establishing and developing digitally uh, supported curricula. 
The project is carried out in collaboration with CHARMS University of Technology and Delft uh, University of Technology. Anand is a research assist, uh, associate and academic coordinator of the Master Track in Quantum Technology at Aachen University. I see your presentation, Anand. Uh, the floor here is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Grazia, for the kind introduction. And also thank you to uh, Grazia Oksana and all the organizers of the EQPC 2021 Workshop 6.3 for giving us an opportunity to here to share our work. Hello, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to talk about efforts from three universities to construct a common digitized platform uh, for internationalization. Uh, it is a part of a project uh, 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 which is a part of the so-called our master's two years master study track, uh, which we started at the Aachen. It's called quantum technology. And uh, although today I'm going, not going to talk about this, but if you have any questions related to the, our uh, two years master study track, I would be happy to answer them. So, uh, following is the um, outline. Oh, sorry, yeah, exactly. So uh, I shall start with a brief introduction to the MyScore project, followed by the major part of the, my talk will focus on the digitized platform for international, internationalization. And finally, I shall conclude our, uh, uh, with an outlook. Um, so let's start with the MyScore project. Uh, the digital platform for international master studies um, is a part of the MyScore project, which stands for Mobility System Cooperation in Higher Education. The goal uh, of this project is to enhance the digital offering and make the potential of digitization available for internalization on a large scale. It is financially supported by the Federal Ministry of Education Research of Germany and uh, German Academic Exchange uh, Service as part of uh, International uh, Mobility and Cooperation Digital Program. The MySchool project is coordinated by the International Office of RWDH Aachen University and is a collaboration between the uh, faculties and the department, including the Department of Physics. So uh, now let's uh, move. Um, uh, let's move to the uh, uh, to more uh, more focus on the MySQL project itself. So um, uh, so here we, uh, as you can see, um, the digital. Uh, the, the idea with the MySQL project is uh, we follow the so-called distance learning and assess, distance assessment approach. What it means is that the students get an access to our uh, to other university courses via distance learning, and they get assessed for the learning outcomes through the distance assessment method. The MySQL physics team of RWTH uh, Aachen uh, University uh, approached two of its four IDEA League partner universities namely Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden and the Delft University of Technology uh, in Netherlands. And we visited them in uh, February 2020, which is just before the uh, corona started. Um, yeah, so at that, those times we could actually move around very easily. And uh, now we hope that we could uh, also do and uh, collaborate and uh, with more partners uh, around the world as well. So yeah, anyhow, during these meetings, uh, we have uh, uh, we had a lot of discussion about what uh, could be the um, uh, study or the topic uh, which could interest all of us. And actually uh, the advanced selected topics in the field of quantum technology appeared as common uh, interest. It was the reason was because we already had, uh, we already share uh, uh, research interest. Uh, a lot of researchers from TU Delft and Chalmers universities are collaborating with our researchers. So uh, we thought that, okay, if you want to educate uh, in this direction, then quantum technology uh, uh, would, be the, would be the ideal topic. And because since we also have our already the master's uh, program, uh, master's study track uh, developed already here in Aachen. Uh, so we thought it would be a natural step uh, for us to move in this direction. So the three universities started sharing the courses from the summer uh, semester 2020, and I will share uh, some of the results from, from those. Uh, so, so here you will see the courses shared among the three universities and the number of students participating in these courses. In the pie chart shown on the left, uh, the innermost circle consists of the names of the un three universities with the abbreviation mentioned on the right hand side. The middle circle composed, uh, composed of the winter and the summer semesters of 2020 and 2021. Uh, the outermost circle are the five courses shared between the three universities with the abbreviation as given on the right-hand side. Please note that the bold uh, letters mean that these 
um, uh, are completely new uh, courses and the names of the universities in the bracket means uh, they are host universities, which is indicated in the pie chart with letter H in the bracket. As can be seen, 63% of the students participating in these uh, courses were from RWTH, 19 were from the Chalmers Institute of Technology, and 18 from the TU Delft. Moreover, three of the uh, three out of the two courses uh, were shared in the winter semester uh, because we, uh, we because at the time we could plan it way more better. In the current, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, we also had a uh, lot of other uh, courses, which I will also share in a, in a minute also. So in this slide, you can see that the course evaluation for three out of the five courses are shown. Um, uh, the number uh, means, uh, the number one means a very good rating, while number five means very poor rating. I'm mentioning this because in some universities it's exactly opposite, uh, where five means bad rating and one is uh, good. Uh, but at ours, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the other way around. So on the left are the two new courses, while on uh, one on the right is an old course. Uh, old course in the sense it's, it was already offered uh, before we started our collaboration. So, uh, and the two uh, new are on the left hand side. As you can see, the global indicator for the new courses is not far from the very well established old courses. And overall, it's a very strong positive evaluation uh, report from the uh, students and it uh, with a well-defined lecture and exercise concepts. So here you will see the list of uh, the uh, uh, courses that are offered in, by the RWTH in the summer semester 2021. Uh, unfortunately, only two Chalmer uh, students participated in the advanced quantum electronics course. And, um, and uh, we have been informed this is because the master students are already preoccupied by too many courses as a part of their study curriculum. And moreover, there is uh, uh, unfortunately no dedicated person or academic coordinator in Chalmers uh, uh, to, to, or, or to does to carry on uh, for that. Um, um, so, and this is in the, in this slide, you will see the list of courses offered in the winter semester 2021 and 2022 uh, um, from Aachen University. The courses marked with the star are being conducted in the hybrid seminar room, which is shown on the right hand side. It's a very a new uh, room, and if I would be happy to give more uh, detailed information if someone is interested in uh, knowing more about it. Um, so two PhD students from Chalmers have registered, and students from Delft have not registered for any course uh, uh, as of now, but uh, 20 students from RWH are participating in the quantum computing course offered from the Chalmers uh, University in this uh, semester. So with this, I come to the conclusion of my talk. Um, I hope I could convince you that uh, my score shared courses were a success in, uh, in, uh, in the last one and a half years with strong participation of RWTH, uh, RWTH uh, students and positive evaluation reports. However, as you have seen that the participation of Chalmers and QTA students uh, have been limited. Uh, as I mentioned, only PhD students uh, usually are uh, the ones who are, uh, in, or who are uh, basically uh, joining our courses. Uh, while the master students are preoccupied with theory courses offered by their own universities. So it means there's a lot of work to be done. And uh, as an outlook uh, using virtual reality uh, developed by Professor Nakhan here at RWTH uh, Aachen University, we would like to offer some experimental or programming labs and we are developing concepts related to the, uh, such courses. And so it's a quite a new thing that we are working on. We would also, uh, we would like to introduce more courses uh, in the digitalized, uh, in the um, uh, to reach our uh, to reach out our my score uh, goal, we also would like to contact more universities. In particularly, the um, the idea, the two. I mean, for example, the connecting with the two other Idea League universities, uh, which are namely the ETH Zurich and Polytechnico di Milano, would be a natural step because they also have similar master program like ours. Uh, we would like to develop common uh, learning uh, platforms like for developing a platform which has a uh, same courses and uh, exams being evaluated at, this, uh, at, the, at the one particular level and sharing equal responsibilities and uh, thus uh, minimizing administrative difficulties so that it is more fun in the project rather than being a burden on one of the universities. Last but not the least, I have to uh, admit that due to my score and teaching activities, uh, we could not devote too much time with the uh, 
uh, with the uh, QT EDU. However, in the coming weeks or months, we would like to increase our visibility and join the formidable, very uh, strong efforts from the QT EDU in connecting to more students and universities interested in the distance uh, learning and education. Of course, all these work is not done just by me. Uh, there is a whole team and a whole uh, lot of people involved and such a collaboration could not have been possible also with the help of them. We of course have uh, 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 financial support from the DAAD and the BMPF, which I already mentioned, and uh, the talented as well as very cool uh, MyFlix team of uh, Dr. Shefan Rhodes, Paramita, Dr. Paramita Day, I and our former colleague, Dr. Tham Thomas Rademacher, who's actually involved in creating this hybrid classroom. Uh, on behalf of the MyScore Physics, I would once again like to thank the organizers uh, for giving us uh, the opportunity to share our work. Uh, and last but not the least, thanks to all of you for listening. And I would be glad to answer any questions if you have. Thank you, Anand. Thanks. Um, so many questions arising. Uh, I would say let's start with the first uh, question that arrived from Rainer Muller. Uh, Rainer, if you want to unmute yourself and add anything. Um, meanwhile, I will uh, read the question. So I wonder how it is possible to apply individual judgment uh, in compliance with German administration laws. This is for Alex and Rainer in case you want to add. Yeah, it's just uh, I wonder how personal judgment can be a criterion on this such a formal procedure. I'd be happy uh, if, if it would be allowed, but I I don't doubt it is. No, it's of course it's not. Um, Rainer, you're an expert in, at the university structure. So the way it works, or the way we did, we have a curriculum aptitude test. So it's a curriculum analysis. So we give points um, for certain experimental um, courses, theoretical courses, mathematical courses, and general scientific courses. And this is um, open to all applicants. And by that, they it's amazing that they really know how much points they expect to get. And um, by that, they this is one part. And the second one is basically the mark. We give also a certain um, bonus uh, for the very good students, um, in particular when they come from chemistry and something. I mean, they get all those same bonus, but of course, when you say they don't have the education, but they're still excellent students, you should want to have them. And then, of course, uh, the third part is a motivation letter. And there's a little bit of a flexibility in there but this is um, how far we could get and then finally we also have a direct interview stage mm -hmm. and again with ranking but I can tell you uh, the students are getting more and more informed about what is possible and what is impossible for to us <laughs> <laughs> thanks but I can give you the links if you want uh, we do okay. it yeah, yeah. and then we have another question for Alex from Andres was it easy to convince LMU and TUM administration to launch a joint program? After all, those are two locally com competing universities. This issue might arise in Budapest as well with TU Budapest and um, Edvos University. So Anand, if you want to add anything otherwise. You're muted. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, no, that's my question, yeah. Okay, so I can tell you how it worked in Munich. Um, first of all, we allied um, within this excellence cluster. So basically we found about 40 PIs who said, okay, this is the way to go. And then we decided how it should be structured in a rough way. And then we decided, okay, this is the only way we want to do it. And then afterwards we talked to the presidencies of both universities and said, okay, take it or leave it. And otherwise you don't get it. And um, that is how we made it work. But um, what I really learned and was surprising to me, um, how different um, the two universities are legally. I mean, the way they're structured with respect to exams, degrees, certificates and everything, it's really surprising. They're both Munich universities, they're just in the same state of Bavaria. They're not even in other states, like in Braunschweig with Rainer, for example. And it, it was really difficult to find a solution to that, but it only works when one of the universities steps down legally and accepts to some degree. You have to have a cooperation contract on that, um, what is allowed and, of course, but um, the way it worked in our case, uh, together with Jan von Delft, who is also in the audience, was always on the same level. And we said, okay, uh, we're just equal in all decisions what we take. 
and um, that worked out. And of course, in the background, I also showed it in the, in the slides, it did work that basically um, we have the excellence cluster and that made a, a large impact to both presidents and also to the Ministry of Science in um, Bavaria. That we said, okay, this is important to us. We want to do it, and um, this is the way to go. So we we did not discuss too much after our de decision. Maybe if I could just add one thing. Um, hi, Alex. So Alex and I always see eye to eye, but as you mentioned, our university, LMU, decided to um, accept all the rules of the technical university. So the the administration is governed uh, done completely by the technical university, and our university just said, okay, that's fine with us. And that was the way to resolve the fact that all our rules are not consistent. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thank you very much. Maybe I can also add something because we have, will have a community discussion. We have a similar situation here with Braunschweig and Hanover, two cities about 50 kilometers apart, have also common excellence clusters. And we have solved it this way that we have two courses to different courses because it was administratively very difficult in a, in a short time to make a common course and they are mutually recognized all all credit that you make so it's uh, uncomplicated uh, to to move credits from one place to the other but of course there has to be a, a good will, will on both sides to make this work but in your case, it's two separate masters. Two separate trainings. courses, really separate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem, if I may add to that, um, I mean, this works for two universities in the same state of Germany, but already we had discussions uh, with other universities international. But if you want to do that internationally and you accept all the courses from the other universities, you run really into legal problems because uh, with this ECTS system, I learned how different it is um, interpreted uh, throughout Europe. And um, when once you accept certain courses at your own university, it's, it can be really interesting. I mean, that it becomes illegal, full stop. You have to have a co coordinate, uh, cooperation contract, yes. Exactly. Yeah. If I may add, um, there are other examples on collaboration between universities here in Scotland, we have the International Graduate School for Quantum Technologies. It's between the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow University and Harriowood. Um, the only way that it works is by kind of creating or building another body. Uh, so we, we call it like this, this International Graduate School, but we have kind of um, taking expertise from the different universities. We have the lessons and we kind of package it in a completely different program that it goes under the umbrella of the Physics Alliance in Scotland. So there are ways to do this, but yeah, normally it has to go under a different body, kind of a separated from the, from the kind of a, each university. And there is the, the one in Strasbourg, you know, about this one, Andres, where they, they work with some universities in Germany. So yeah, I think it's, it's the only way to, to move forward because some universities have the expertise on maybe a specific platform for quantum computing and they work together with another one that works on quantum communication and I have seen universities who are expressing interest as well from engineering who would like to work with more fundamental physics universities in terms of putting together this syllabus so this is for the discussion later but I think there is opportunity for collaboration between e even different countries. Thanks. Thanks um, then I have a comment Oh. Can I add to that? I mean, I'll tell you, I like this idea. I mean, I see the solution, the legal solution to that. But um, as we are here in the audience, um, one has to really decide if you want to have this super pan uh, university, because then you get all, all of us rely on the state funding, as, at least in Germany, for the universities. And if you think about a pan-European or even pan-German uh, um, university, you are uh, basically, um, that will be a quantum revolution um, in all aspects. And um, I, I think you lose control of a lot of aspects, what you thought is um, natural for you. I mean, we're talking about the bachelor courses and so forth. Yeah, for, for bachelors, it's a completely different story. And this is one of the discussions that we have a lot in, when we have the, the pilots with QT Edu and also in Quick, because when we are talking here about masters or Kind of doctorate programs that are kind of more individual 
But if you talk about bachelors, this is completely, yeah, I agree. The, the legal way, it has to come from top down. It has to come from the government. So yeah, this is, this is something that we should discuss really further, how we could embed quantum technologies within bachelors and how we could do it without losing control. I agree. Grazia, do we have a bit of time uh, in community discussion? Yes, I, wanted, I yes. wanted to mention that. So we are merging the Q&A with the yeah. discussion. So yeah. please feel free. I will just make sure that we address all questions yes, yes, before we end. So, my question in this context would be, has anybody experience with this concept of European universities, uh, which is pursued now uh, by the uh, EU? I, I just don't only know this, this, this keyword, but I don't know what is behind it, whether well, it could be helpful. You mean by the European universities, like for yeah. example, the a program called European universities, yeah. but they don't know much about it. I think what what they do is kind of a being kind of bilingual, and this is done. This is what I know. Uh, I don't know if this is really accurate, but this is done for uh, maybe people from specific countries that are um, kind of um, elsewhere because of their jobs, like uh, maybe people from consulates and so on, they are part of this European university. So they go there and this is kind of a something that goes under the umbrella of being European without being under one specific country. This Sorry. is what I understand. I don't Sorry, know. Uh, Sally, yeah, go. That's, uh, that's not exactly accurate. So the European Union universities is an umbrella name for the different consortia that are being formed that are sort of the five partners joining together in a European university. Uh, 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 consortium and there are I think 15 of those 15 times five so a lot of the European un uh, universities have joined together in groups of five uh, and I can post the link in the chat for, for those so those are the those are they they have high level decided uh, that to to make it more easy to have uh, collaboration between sort of the partner within each university European university consortium and this is a, who is coordinating this it's it is a it is an EU program in which oh, okay. uh, it is uh, it is uh, they have applied these alliances have applied um, and then they are formally accepted into a European universities program. Okay, thank you. I then we'll go ahead with the next question. So we have actually a comment from our Sally. Um, diversity is a very important point. I see the issue in quantum resourcing as well. Um, and then I don't know, Araceli, if you want to add anything. Yeah, or just I can, as we are yeah. in the discussion as well. Um, yeah. It's because I have seen there are a lot of companies that they say are looking for these specific skills. That is already hard because the pool is not huge. And then they said, if it's possible, I would like a woman or uh, I would like um, a diverse candidate let's put it this way from you know if we are talking about us we would like someone who is coming from a specific background so imagine how small then the pool is because it's already pretty small and yeah there the majority we are talking about men uh, male students but if we uh, like we, i want a person that ticks all these boxes and really a lot of companies i think they put too many boxes to tick in this case and then they said if it's possible, we would like a woman. What is happening is that I have seen some jobs that have been out there for almost a year and it's impossible to find a person. So yeah, that was just a comment there. Yeah, no, it's uh, very true. Uh, even for more than one year, right? It's, uh, it's a problem. Um, then I have a question from Oksana Mishina. Uh, so for Alex, regarding gender balance, uh, thank you for sharing. Do you have a chance to have female role models among your program organizers, teachers, and uh, if you could share your strategies for gender sensitive promotion, um, complain of your course? Um, first of all, uh, we have professors like Monika Eidelsburger. Um, she teaches the quantum hardware course, and I, we hope um, that she's a role model. I know her, she doesn't like this um, expression, uh, particularly applied to herself, but uh, um, it's obvious, right? If a successful scientist gives um, these really hardcore courses on quantum physics, if she's a role model. And um, what we're also building up right now is a network between all female students uh, that we meet and um, 
one of our employees is taking care of those um, students and that we share these the needs and um, discuss everything. And of course, on top of that, um, we have at the TUM and the LMU, the typical measures like a girls day and um, where we have particular uh, events where we also in, uh, invite um, pupils from schools um, to get um, triggered and so forth. That is what we do. Thank you. That's a very interesting. I think uh, many universities are trying to, you know, give more attention to this uh, big problem. So thank you for sharing. Um, then another question from Oksana Michina for Araceli. Um, so it's in the chat. Uh, we saw in comparison with uh, 2018 state of the art, an amazing pool of education opportunity exists today, which is a great pleasure to see. Have you noticed a change in the um, quantum technology professional number growth in the last two years already? Um, I don't know, Oksana, if you mean you... about professionals, mm -hmm. uh, like people working in, in jobs in quantum? Yeah, I mean, the, the, what is provided by the education opportunities. So we hope that we train a bit more experts now. This is just a sensitivity of yours because you are very much in the field. Do you see that it comes out and the companies start to have a bit of a breath in comparison to 2018? Oh, OK. If we talk about the resources, there are much more resources that we have seen, uh, whether this has uh, helped um, to have more people ready. Mm, that's a very good question. I have the feeling that some people are coming out of these masters uh, thinking that they can find a job right away in quantum and it's not the case, unfortunately, because again, we are in the face of fundamental research and people need much more expertise. So there are more people with more knowledge about quantum in general, but it doesn't mean that they are all kind of ready to be um, fit into a specific role. But I think this is going to change. It's going to change because the roles are going to kind of become less experts and, and kind of um, you just want people with an overview. And these people who are out of these masters are going to be ready. So it's kind of a transition that is starting to, to be merged. But yeah, it, I think it's going to take uh, a little bit of time. Thank you. And I have a question uh, for Anand in the chat. Uh, by Oksana. Is your live online assessment tool accessible only for the courses uh, participant or could it be possible to you also use it as an assessment tool for students who followed a different program elsewhere? Yeah, thanks Oksana for the question. Yeah, uh, for now it's uh, uh, it's only an RWDH uh, assessment tool. Uh, so it is developed uh, for our students taking our courses and also or uh, uh, and our students also involved in other courses. So it's a local, so to say, tool. But uh, as I had also mentioned that uh, in my outlook, one of the things we would like to also do is that develop a so-called a common platform that would be nice where, you know, universities can join uh, and, uh, and uh, basically students can also obviously join. And so such thing ex exists within our so-called idea league uh, uh, universities. I was informed this the tool is called SIROP, S-I-R-O-P. Um, so uh, such thing exert, uh, exists, but we have not explored that yet. And we would also like to, once we learn then, then step by step to uh, gradually to extend it in a way that it can be used by any other universities as well. So it certainly is possible, but we have not exactly worked on that in that direction. Uh, as I just one other thing which I would like to also mention, which is uh, what Alex also mentioned, uh, is actually uh, regarding the ECTS. So um, the problem with the, the uh, universities are also even within Europe. Let's let's focus only in Europe, and then we can focus uh, the whole worldwide. Is that the ECTS is also not common? I will just give you one example. Uh, the quantum computing course shared by the Chalmers University, and we have a lot of students, our students joining the, these course. Uh, so the locally, the Chalmers universities, they give a credit of 7.5. At RWTH, we don't have half integer ECTS. So, um, so we gave them, our students, as eight ECTS for that same course. Then came a question from the students of Chalmers, why RWTH students are getting eight ECTS, which is half ECTS more than what we are doing. So in order to circumvent this very, very trivial problem, uh, what Chalmers did was they gave a bit of extra homework for RWTH students 
And so in that sense, you can justify that, okay, RWH2 students can get more ECTS. So it's such a small problem uh, in a way, but uh, uh, they can, uh, you know, they can uh, get enlarged if you are sharing with other universities which don't have the same ECTS system. Um, so that's, uh, this is one of the uh, small problems, but there are many other uh, uh, also more, but I think it would be nice to, first of all, understand all university system systematically and then to uh, and then to try to form a so-called a common uh, some uh, you know bridging point and then one can start from there yeah thank you nan yeah not an easy task but very much needed um then i have another question uh, from andras uh, to anan is your program open for students outside of the three university you mentioned uh, also a very good question. So as I mentioned, uh, as I gave an example that we, for us, a natural step was to extend our, uh, uh, or shake hands with our other two partners of the Idea League universities, but of course they're not limited to, uh, since we also actually got, um, um, uh, I, we got emails from Technion University in Israel. And I'm, I'm just right now going a little bit uh, further away. And uh, if you allow me to go more further away, we also got uh, a request uh, or email from Tsinghua University in, in China. Um, so in um, so we are actually uh, although we have uh, not started because as I said there is a lot of things when we offer certain courses we have to take into account. For example, with Shingwa, uh, one thing would be a problem would be uh, time wise, uh, like the, there is a, a time difference of seven hours. So if Shingwa is offering courses at ten o'clock in in China, our students have to be awake at three o'clock, which is uh, of course if it's uh, live and not uh, in a flipped classroom type of courses. So. Uh, there are a lot of things that one has to think, uh, um, uh, but uh, talking of within the Europe, we are certainly uh, way more uh, also open and we would like to also uh, shake hands with our own European partners as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Um, okay, if, if there is one more question, we can take it. Uh, and otherwise, we will go to um, our activity. Let's wait a few seconds. Um, otherwise, uh, there will be more discussion uh, in our next activity, so that's also fine. OK. So I would like to invite you all uh, to go to the mirror link that I will be putting now on the chat. So what we would like to do uh, during these activities is to collect input from the community um, to see which uh, are the educational goals in three years time and six, 10 years time. Um, and this would be to collect inputs for the roadmap uh, through quantum uh, education. I'm sharing the uh, link and then I will uh, give you instructions on uh, how to do it. So I will share my screen. Yeah, I hope you can all see it. So as you can see, there are the two questions I mentioned. Uh, we would like to see which are, uh, which is the vision and the goals of quantum education in three years and then six to 10 years. Uh, in this afternoon uh, session, there will also be a discussion, which are the challenges, of course. Here is more about what should be there uh, in that uh, time frame. So more short term, more longer term. Uh, I would like to invite you to uh, take, um, to start from the left, so uh, in three years time, with the green sticky notes, you can see it in the middle. Uh, you can place one, you can take one, uh, place one uh, in the box, and write uh, your idea. Uh, what I would like to ask you is to also add the target audience. So, for example, um, if you think there should be a bachelor course in quantum uh, in three years time, uh, you can write that and then on top of it, write um, the target audience, so bachelor students. Uh, so that would be, let's see if I can. And you can adapt the size. And if you want to write your name, you can, of course, also write your name under it. 
So target audience first, and then uh, the goal you propose, and if you want uh, uh, your name. Okay. I will leave you some time to do that, uh, maybe a minute at least, and then we can start commenting on them. Okay, maybe 30 more seconds and then we can start commenting. Okay, so the first one uh, that I saw by Alex um, down here, I will just open it a little bit more. Um, I would be interested, Alex, if you want to uh, to comment on it. Um, so if I understand correctly, um, you believe that a bachelor course on quantum uh, science and technology is not a good uh, option. So like a minor or even one course in bachelor. Is is this what, what you mean or could you please comment on that? Um, okay, <laughs> thank you for <laughs> putting me out there already at the beginning. Um, yeah, okay. no, I, think it's, is... I think it's an interesting point and... I mean, there are many aspects. Okay, let me yeah. try to summarize these. I mean, the first one is the interdisciplinary. I mean, it's about the readiness of the students after the high school or whatever Matura would call it um, for the concept of quantum physics and quantum science. And um, I mean, we have this curriculum in physics, which has been taught since I think 60 years in the same manner, where quantum mechanics only comes in the fourth semester. And you need uh, concepts of um, Hamiltonians and so forth. I mean, please all the didactic professors here in this um, audience, please correct me, but um, I've been teaching most of the courses and I always see um, it takes time that they understand the concepts. Um, and this interdisciplinary argument then um, is also applied to what you would have to, would like to have in future um, for the uh, companies. Um, it's not good that you, in my personal point of view, have to say that you mainstream um, what you think right now is important, if, for example, for IBM or whatever quantum computing company. Um, but in future, you need to have a more spread of ideas based on fundamental insights 
um, what will be the next uh, quantum application or the first quantum application or whatever you call that. And um, it's also when you talk to the CTOs and CEOs, um, they still rely on us universities that these alumni understand um, the fundamentals on a fundamental way. They don't want to have um, persons um, from, let's say, high school, which they can teach in their specific product line. You, they can do that and they do that, of course, but they really want to have physicists, they want to have chemists, they want to have mathematicians, they want to have computer scientists, uh, which uh, uh, where the companies can benefit from the interdisciplinary approaches and trainings. And uh, the last point, the third one, is again uh, with the bachelor courses. Um, I mean, of course, of course, when you do it on your university itself, my feeling is, I mean, there have been 20 years ago these uh, special courses on nanophysics and nanosciences. And when you look at these courses from retrospective quality measures, I have to say most of these um, alumni, they have then uh, specialized in one of the disciplines what I just mentioned. I mean, nanophysics was all over the place 10, 20 years ago. And uh, of course, there's, the nanosciences are still there. I mean, uh, while talking, I mean, they're the, the, to some part the techniques what a lot of quantum technologies use now. But you don't want to have this generalist um, educated that he doesn't or she doesn't know very fundamental insights of the concept. This is my point. So sorry for this dominating opinion here. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And I think maybe it's not a you know a popular opinion, but that's maybe even um, why it's even more interesting. Uh, at least to me, it is. And so you would advise, let's say, in waiting during the master to go into specialization of quantum, let's say, because the third year of bachelor would not be. Uh, I can give you another example. I mean, for quantum information theory, I mean, uh, students ask me, why don't we put, um, for example, the, quant uh, the second quantization into the program before they start um, even the first uh, mandatory course? This is the feedback what we get from the students. Mm -hmm. So they uh, basically say, why did you even think about teaching us quantum information theory if we haven't uh, heard about the second quant quantization? And uh, this is a valid argument, uh, but as we all know from our bachelor courses, the second quantization is typically taught in the fifth semester, at least in Germany. And there's a long way to understand all the concepts behind that. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to uh, comment on that, um, bring their opinion. Just a brief comment. Yeah. Uh, some people are thinking, exactly on the same lines to quote Dieter Mescheter, the former president of the German Physical Society, so a prominent person. He says more or less the same than Alex said. Uh, mm -hmm. Better does not make sense. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point because many universities also have, um, for example, QDEL, a minor uh, program in quantum. So I'm, uh, yeah, I think it's valuable for everyone to know uh, the different opinions and so thank you again, Alex. Um, then I don't know if there is anyone who wrote a sticky note that wants to go for and comment, or I can maybe uh, call. Just uh, up to you. If you want to um, introduce your point, your sticky note, you can just unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, I'm happy to speak up and, and introduce what I wrote. So I wrote, goal for us in Budapest, find ways to expose our students in practical experimental quantum technology, for example, hands-on experience with uh, superconducting qubits, ion clubs, and so on. So I think uh, probably most of Eastern Europe has a similar problems that, uh, that somehow the technological or experimental direction of quantum physics is not that well developed uh, because of uh, scarce resources. Uh, and um, and I think, so, so we, we, we do have uh, quantum information science, quantum computing courses, which are mostly theoretical. So we have some expertise in theory, but much less uh, expertise and resources in terms of experiments. So for us, it would be very interesting to find uh, collaboration opportunities with, with other universities 
which have you know established experimental setups where where we could train our our students. So that's just one point. I think this is more relevant for Eastern Europe, but there are many countries in Eastern Europe. So so maybe this is an, an idea to discuss. Yeah, and I also see on the right side the um, another sticky note um, that was about the exchange pro. Yeah. Uh, easing clear study exchange program for master students, et cetera. So this might be also, yeah, at the end would be an exchange uh, program, right? Unless it's what you're suggesting. Yes, some kind of an exchange yeah. program, for example. Yes, yes. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Um, Anand, I see you raise your hand. Hand, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, yeah, actually, I would like to come back to what Alex uh, said in the previous comment regarding the bachelor courses. So I was uh, thinking a little bit about, uh, about it. So that's why it took a while for me to gather my words and everything. Um, so uh, the point is, um, so here in uh, at RWTH, our master's program is a joint collaboration between the Department of Physics and the Faculty of Electric Engineering. Now the question comes, what do we do with the electrical engineers? How do we introduce them to this, uh, uh, to, uh, to the entire uh, you know, uh, 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 yeah, to the realm of quantum physics and so on and so forth. So what we did was we developed a course called Quantum Mechanics for Electrical Engineers. And it's a very preliminary course. Of course, we don't teach second quantization and uh, many things over there. Um, uh, uh, in, in, in depth, uh, I meant it's a very, uh, uh, it's also, by the way, not wave mechanics approach, rather it's more of a uh, Heisenberg, I mean, matrix mechanics approach uh, that we use because ultimately what we think is might be relevant for uh, uh, most of the quantum, uh, at least for the information, are the is a matrix mechanics uh, approach. And so what we did was uh, we introduced this course and we saw that these uh, engineers are participating in many other courses. So for example, just to give you an example, uh, there's a condensed matter physics one course. And this course also, uh, by the way, last or, or at one particular point, we do have second quantization in details apart from superconductivity and also even uh, magnetism introduced there because they need to know the concepts of spins and also uh, superconductors in general. So these students, they start even joining uh, uh, these courses as well. So what my point here is, uh, of course, at the bachelor level at RWTH, we also don't have any solid state physics course as such. I mean, we do have a very, very, uh, very uh, simple, uh, it's called physics for nanostructures. It's, in a, it's not a really solid state uh, physics course, but it is partly being uh, covered there. And the point here is, uh, if we can teach the engineers and we can get them and uh, get them on board at the master's level, which is a bit higher, then the question is, uh, why can't it be done at the bachelor's level? I mean, this is the question that which I'm asking myself a bit louder and not louder, but I want to also pose it to you all. So I would like to uh, just ask, I think it is possible if one exactly targets what is our goal, right? So as it was also asked, what do I want to get as the, as the bachelor's level? Of course, if they are taking uh, courses like the mathematics methods in the first semester, then followed by classical mechanics and followed by electrodynamics, then followed by uh, quantum mechanics and then statistical physics, which is usually the course in, at RWTH uh, at the five uh, semesters of bachelor's. But then at one particular point, if I want to specialize in quantum technology, let us say, and if I want to create a bachelor's level program itself, which is a three-year program. So I think it's apart from teaching these basic uh, courses, one can also, I think, introduce uh, courses which are relevant for the quantum technology. At what level? This, I right now, I don't know. I don't have an answer, maybe, but at least they can be introduced. Uh, and this, I think, is also makes sense because if we are talking in educating them in school, uh, which is even lower level, which it becomes exponentially difficult to explain them compared to a bachelor level, uh, then why uh, bachelor level is not a, I mean, why is it not possible there? Yeah, I don't know if there are uh, thoughts about that. If anyone wants to add in it, Alex, maybe. Yeah, I, I want to keep it short. I mean, Anand, yeah. I totally agree. Um, and as in Aachen in Munich, uh, we have electrical engineers, but also other material scientists, even um, civil engineers um, who listen to modules in quantum physics and also uh, physics in the broader sense. 
And um, my point is still that I like these students to be really trained in their, in, for instance, electrical engineering concepts. That's one point. I mean, it's already open to that. I mean, the systems are open for that. The second point is my personal belief is that um, the quantum uh, uh, science and technology finally moves then either to computer science um, in, in respect that quantum computing becomes part of the supercomputing com community, like in Jülich. Um, and then the other point is um, auto engineers. And so and this is but also the development, again, what I see more in the master level. So to summarize, I think in bachelor, we already have the cross um, discipline uh, possibilities at hand, it already works. And um, finally, we have to, in my point of view, we have to look at it where it devolves in future and these will be driven by the applications what we have. Right, so yeah, I, I see the point and I think it does make sense. What I was thinking along the lines was, um, uh, is it possible to start a, uh, a bachelor level course uh, which is aiming towards quantum science and technology. Uh, the question is which faculty should host it uh, or not only just the faculty, but the department uh, so that uh, you can uh, give them very basic fundamentals from uh, for the quantum science and technology from the very beginning itself. So what I mean by that is not following the usual course of bachelors of uh, in physics, which I mentioned the five courses in five first five semesters. Uh, engineers, by the way, they also have something similar in their first five semesters a year, I can show the program also if you're interested. But then the question would be, I, if you want to create a bachelor at the quantum science, so that bachelor is not particularly linked only to physics or to electrical engineering or to material science or to chemistry or to uh, computer science and so on and so forth, right? So uh, if, if one talks of a bachelor level program, then perhaps one has to think at an independent level itself. The only question would be, uh, what are the detailed subject matters? what do we want to cover and who will be the hosting faculty or the department? I think that's perhaps maybe my understanding. Yeah, maybe I'm just saying something here. I, I, would, I would like to uh, continue this conversation, but unfortunately we're already one minute late. So uh, I don't know, Alex, if you want to add something very briefly, otherwise I will, yeah, maybe you can continue the conversation. Uh, I apologize for late. I apologize no, don't for worry. This no, it's it's very interesting on the conversation. I rather not uh, cut it to be honest, but I just uh, I just have to. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, a special thank you to the four speakers. And uh, now we will go on with our last ten minutes together uh, before uh, the game, the break, and the game. Uh, so what we are going to do now. Um, Myself, uh, Jacob Sherson, Oksana Mishina, and Ryan Müller uh, is a closing summary of what has been uh, done during this um, conference uh, in quantum uh, education. Um, is everyone here? I'm not sure. I think so. I see, yeah, Rainer, uh, Jacob was there, and Oksana as well. So probably we want to start um, from schools and outreach. Uh, Oksana, just to summarize. Um, yeah, I see, I just see one uh, comment from Oksana uh, about the discussion we had uh, earlier. So that this discussion is extremely important um, and that we will continue uh, during our working group meetings in March uh, from the 7th until yeah. the 11th. I, I do agree. Very good point. Thank you, Oksana. No, I pick up from there. And since uh, I was the one uh, starting the workshops, I probably also start the, the conclusion summary. And uh, from first of all, thank you to all of you for this amazing uh, flow. I think we have had uh, inputs from so different levels, which was uh, general level, the level of uh, hard effort with pilots and the level of very deep inside from some specific efforts. And this uh, made uh, a very complete and, and nice uh, 
perspective on how much we we already have in the community. Thank you all, all the presenters uh, for these efforts. Now, specifically for the outreach part, which was actually the shortest uh, uh, in this in this uh, in this whole flow. Um, but this does not mean to say the smallest, actually, because we saw 30 partners uh, already uh, intensely working on producing some things in common and uh, trying to enlarge the, um, the, the opportunities. But the important key point that was underlined many times is that outreach is not something standalone, but it's also a very important component to engage upfront those who will then be learners of a deeper education so that uh, these are important and all levels are part of the general public standalone but uh, the school students have to be motivated and engaged by outreach to start studying the bachelor students have to be motivated and engaged to start studying masters the master students should be motivated and engaged to maybe involve themselves in a in a internship in the companies and so on. So this motivating and engaging part in times of games and some other interactive activities is starting to penetrate in most of the education programs and this is fantastic. So that would be the, the overall conclusion uh, of, the, of the outreach part and uh, I pass then the word to Reiner to continue with the school. Yeah, with respect to high school, I was extremely delighted to see uh, what the pilots have achieved already in the short time of existence and without any funding, one must say. Uh, we had five different pilots for uh, high school education with very diverse topics and all of them really made sense, uh, showed approaches that you can follow in high school on a qualitative level, on a, on a yeah, maybe yeah, a scientific level uh, of, of um, yeah, developing tools for evaluating knowledge in high school. So we have seen a lot of things that we had developed and uh, well, things are going on and um, yeah, we have set something in motion uh, that, is, that is going to ha happen now. And I think gradually, uh, if there are offers, if there are concepts, uh, they will find their way in the school curricula. Uh, we have seen this in Germany where this movement started 20 years ago, so we have a lot of experience. And now in Germany we have quite good um, state um, regulations for the curricula. They're really good, one must say. And maybe this happens, it takes a lot of time, but maybe it happens in other countries too. I pass over to whom? Jakob. Me, I guess. Uh, okay. I will, uh, since I didn't get it to work yesterday, I will share screen uh, just to press. Can you see uh, the slides now? Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, I just wanted to very, very briefly say in the session yesterday and in the session today, we've seen that there's a lot of things happening on the masters and the higher education sector. And I just wanted to make everyone aware of the, the funding possibilities that are happening and that is that uh, there will be a number of calls for digital masters, two rounds actually, and, and just to show this uh, the funding aspect of it, there will be 70 million uh, euros to be awarded to, to the first round of these specialized education programs, which will be in, in, in a variety of different themes, uh, ranging from AI and data science and blockchain, cybersecurity and quantum, and there was an informational day yesterday uh, arranged by the European Commission. There were 600 people there. And from this screenshot here, you can see that only 2% of the participants were from Quantum. So there's a stiff competition if we want to get uh, these 10 million per uh, consortium, maybe one or maybe even two for the Quantum. Uh, but there is going to be lots of competition. And what we are exploring at the moment in QT Edu and, and throughout the community is whether we can formulate some way of, of having a consortium and a structure that, that will benefit large parts of the, uh, the community to address these uh, synergies and give some, uh, some, some funding to also develop resources that will be common to everyone. This onion layered structure where some of the universities have a fully developed master's program, others have only courses and students, 
and, and maybe provide other uh, uh, capabilities into the network and maybe some of module de developers. And so how can we structure our efforts now? We have done a lot of volunteer work as we have seen and, and, and maybe there is some funding coming if we, if we can manage to, to do this jointly. So, so that was the, the, the call to action from our side. And uh, Jacob, I just want to, um, so there is a question from Araceli, uh, any news regarding UK in the digital calls? Yes, uh, bad news. Maybe uh, want to spend a minute and then I, I don't have much to say because we were all here, so go ahead. Yes, uh, so as I understand it, it is bad news that UK is not involved in digital Europe. Uh, no. Yes. Oh, okay. Thanks, Jake. Frustrating for all of us. Indeed. Okay. Um, then last is me. Uh, well, we were all here, so I don't think I have to uh, add much. However, I want to thank again um, Araceli, Andras, Alex and Anand for what they brought to the conversation and for their talks, giving us an overview of what's going on um, in Europe, also uh, worldwide. And Andras, thank you for um, giving us an update of what's uh, going on with the pilot and to Alex and Anand um, to share their experience at the master level and also um, lifelong learning. I think it was very interesting. Um, one take home message uh, for me is how much uh, collaboration is needed uh, at this level, how much is already in place uh, collaboration wise and how much is more needed. So uh, that was, one of the many takeaways uh, that I want to take with me. Thank you, everyone. Uh, now we will have uh, a break until half past 11. And then at half past 11, you uh, are back here at the same links and everything uh, with Federica Beduini, uh, who will moderate a uh, decision game, an interactive tool to introduce quantum technologies until half past 12. And then this afternoon, uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, there will be another parallel session uh, with Jacob Sherson on um, with invited talks and discussion. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the game. I'll pass it up. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Federica Beduini, as Grazia introduced me before the break. And thank you, everyone, to, to, uh, to stay connected after the break. So the idea now is like to change a little bit because like uh, I would like to introduce you this tool that is the Decide Game Quantum Technology. That is something that we have developed in, at, the, at the outreach team at ICFO. Now I will tell you a little bit more about it. And so the idea is to start a little bit to, to give you an overview of what we do at ICFO uh, in the outreach 
uh, part of, in related to quantum uh, sciences and technologies, and then going through explaining you like a little, little bit the details of this group activities, uh, exactly the design games that is aimed to engage people who have never been in contact with quantum technologies and to discover their potential. And, and also I would try to do it in a, like, I think the best way to discover the design game is to do it actually. So there will be and the, in the middle of, the, of this workshop, a moment where you will be distributed in breakout rooms so that you can talk to the other participant and experiment like a little bit of the taste of what uh, uh, the design game it is really like. And so uh, I will, I will start. And so I, I am, as I said, I am I'm working now as, a, as part of the outreach team at ICFO. ICFO is a research center located in Castel de Fels that is near Barcelona. And ICFO, the name comes from uh, the Catalan acronym for Institute of Photonic Science. This means that we are a research center that we use photons to advance the knowledge in this field. And we, we use it, we use photons as a versatile tools and to like explore many different aspects of science. For example, we work in and at the interface with between light and matter, we work in ultra fast science. Uh, we are developing, we are understanding better the application of light for energy and environment. We are also working in the field of bio nanotechnology and medical photonics, exploring and developing new advanced and quantum materials, but also, and especially uh, for this occasion, it, uh, we work a lot on quantum science and, te and technologies. Just think that like half of the research groups of ICFO are working in some kind of quantum research. And that's why we have a large portfolio of outreach activities dedicated to quantum science and technology. And I would start like to give you like a little bit of taste of the different activities that, that we do. Um, I would start with the like, uh, I think that is more or less in line of what you have heard in the first part of this workshop where they were talking a lot about attracting uh, talented young people uh, to do the like, future like workplace of uh, the there will be because of these emerging quantum technologies so also we are doing something like this um ICFO has been coordinating an european project called carla that is like aiming to um build career camp for early career scientists who are interested to enter the photonics world and then we are building another Quantum, I mean, another Carla Camp dedicated to early career scientists who want to discover and enter into the world of uh, quantum science and technology. And then we'll be uh, in coming up next year, hopefully in person on, on April 8th. So if you also, if you want to learn something more about it, then we can talk about it. And, but all the other things that also I would like to talk to you are more like they're directed to the general public in general to not only to uh, create interest in quantum science and technologies to attract people to this kind of uh, careers but also we are interested to just engage people in general uh, to to see what can quantum technology what quantum technologies can offer to uh, society at large so really like uh, trying to reach all kinds of uh, sectors of society, not only the people who would like to work in quantum technologies. So that, that's why you will see quite different things of what we have talked like in the workshop before. One of the things that we have developed in the last years is the quantum tour, um, which is like a collection of interactive materials, audiovisual, animations, and even 360 degrees photos, to discover quantum technologies and aim to people who have no prior contact with quantum technology. So really starting from the basics and trying to explain why quantum technologies can improve, um, like can introduce benefits to society at the large. And you can try to browse this platform that is available in English, Spanish and Catalan uh, through this website, quantumtour.icfo.eu. Um, also, we have been uh, coordinating and creating the Big Bell Test in 2016, 
which was a citizen science experiment. So we have involved citizen, again, with no prior knowledge about quantum physics, to participate in a quantum physics experiment. Actually, there were like 12 quantum physics experiments, 12 cutting edge quantum physics experiments happening all around the world from Chile to Australia, really crossing the whole globe. And they were like receiving real time data generated by people. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Bell test, which is a, like a very, very landmark experiment in quantum physics, who ne which needs uh, random numbers to be realized. And so one of our PhD students, Carlos Avellan, who now is a CEO in a spin-off, uh, quantum related spin-off that is called QSight, it actually um, um, produces random number generator based on quantum physics. But at the time, at the time he was working during his PhD on these quantum random number generators. And uh, he, he was involved in uh, various different realization of uh, Bell tests all around the world that were employing his quantum random number generator. So he thought that it, we could try to uh, run a Bell test with uh, random numbers generated by people as input, because this could close different loopholes than the ones that are usually closed in different experiments. And so that's why uh, with this help and also then the help of, of a large community of, uh, of people and scientists all around the world, we designed the Big Bell test, which was exactly a Bell test involving different laboratories all around the world where people were sending uh, random numbers to a video game. That's that's what you can see here in the photo. And here you can see some of the events that we organized to involve people. We reached like more than 100,000 people involved in just one day. And this is like the ICFO team working on the Bell test and violating the Bell test. That's why they are so happy in the photo. Other things that we've been doing in the last years is, uh, for example, participating in other programs organized by other people, like the one organized by the Fundació Catalunya La Pedrera, which is a local Catalan foundation who organizes every year the Barcelona International Youth Science Challenge, which is a program directed to young high school students that want to um, be involved in a scientific project. Practically what they do is like they select young and talented people from all around the world, and then they send them to Catalan Research Center for a couple of weeks. And so we as ICFO host like 10, 12 uh, students every year to um, for this two week intensive program about quantum physics using quantum, quantum cryptography as a benchmark to discover every different aspect of the of quantum research. And here there are two of the students of last in person edition. They are like working on their BB84 uh, real uh, experiment. And also when the pandemic struck, like programs, in-person program like this couldn't be realized. And but we went on organizing virtual thing, for example, for the European Quantum Week uh, last uh, last November. We were like um, organizing together with other people uh, in Spain and other university and other centers. Um, an online event called Quantum Technologies in Five Minutes to like engage high school students uh, and to make them learn this amazing and fascinating world. The idea was very simple to have like a streaming where four scientists from different centers, uh, research centers and even companies, Sophia is from a spin-off um, working in quantum and they were like giving flash talks during just five minutes that's where the five minutes of the title comes from and they were like talking about their work and their experience in quantum and then most of the events were was then a round table where the where the students were launching their questions through the chat and then the panel would answer and they were like they ended up to be very very lively discussion and involving more than 1000 students that's why last uh, like uh a couple of weeks ago, we organized another one together with the Barcelona Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, again, talking about quantum in five minutes, again, directed to high school students. And it's been, again, a very large, we, we got again a large participation again. And then also we are organizing 
uh, this is like a long term project and will be soon available on our website. It, I guess between the end of the year and the beginning of next year is the for Maciek Lewestein Quantum School for Teachers. Maciek Lewestein, probably you know him, is a very, very um, important scientist in quantum physics, working especially in the in many fields of theoretical quantum optics. And he, he received one prize for his work some time ago and decided to donate uh, the prize to develop like tools for teachers. Some, some people in the panel before said that it's very, very important if you want to reach uh, the young generation to reach the teachers. And that's actually the idea behind this program. The idea is really to uh, reach out to the teacher, especially high school teacher, and make them learn about quantum technologies and their potential for society to reach even more people, all the students that they will uh, meet during their career and let them know exactly about the benefits that quantum technologies can introduce in their life. So it's not only again to foster scientific career in quantum technologies, but in general to um, make people aware of the possibility of quantum technologies and the possible benefit for society. And Nick von Maciek Lewenstein Quantum School for Teachers, con uh, it's like a, a collection on different materials and contents that we developed during the year for many like, mm, for example, for the quantum tools or for the big belt test. I mean, we, we like put it together like in a nice package and also developing new material for this. And as again, the idea is to make it available online for everyone to browse in and look at it, but also to uh, organize from time to time, like live session with teacher to like, like courses, live courses for them to, to get in, into this amazing world. And the decide game, it was designed exactly as part of this, one of the first material that we developed thinking about this quantum school for teachers. Uh, it's uh, a decide game, it's a group activity. So as you can see here in the photo, you, you do it in divided in small group of four to six people. And the idea is that it's a very valuable tool to introduce an quantum technologies in an interactive and engaging way. But it's based on the, on the, the dynamics of the play decide that I put here the logo, which is a European project that really designed this kind of activities to introduce a new concept, doesn't have to be necessarily quantum technologies, to people who have never heard about it and make them learn about these new concepts in a, in a fun and engaging way. And so we thought that this would be very useful to introduce quantum technologies to this. So that's why we prepare, like we adapted the play decide idea for the quantum technologies. And that's what I what I'd like to to like explain you now a little bit about. So the sites game uh, starts giving the participants a question. And this is the question. Knowing that quantum technologies benefit society in many different ways, how many resources would you commit to develop them? This may be a very strange question to somebody who doesn't know anything about quantum technologies. And remember, a decide game is aimed to somebody who doesn't know anything about the topic or a little bit, no? Doesn't, doesn't, you don't need to be an expert to participate in the decide game. And so people sometimes are like a little bit surprised, but the, really the idea of the decide game is to give all the tools for the people during the activity to reach a de final decision at the end of the activity. So the idea is that a decide game is not your typical scientific activity for school or for people in general, because you don't, you're not making an experiment and you're not uh, attending a conference with a lot of technical content. But it has a very, very good, like let's say advantages because because of this structure, uh, it allows to um, develop uh, also like transversal skills that are very important and are very like valuable, for example, for teachers who want to introduce it in school, but for people in general. And also it makes it like attractive also for people that are not naturally uh, um, curious towards science. And so, like, as I said, it develops like transversal skills, like for example, teamwork, because you have to work in groups of four, six people. It develops critical thinking because you're receiving 
a lot of information that is new and you have to choose yourself what is the information that is more relevant for you and for the group to attain your final goal that is the decision. And also you have to share the information with the rest of the group because we will see later that everyone in the group has different information. So the, the main activity during the decide game is to share information between the participants. And so you also have to be good at communicating stuff with your to your peers. So with no further ado, I will give you an overview of the structure of the decide game. But then I want to go like, let's say, to be uh, face by face so you then can get a, like a, a broader and now a broader view and then a deeper view. So the idea is that you have four phases. Uh, you have the first three phases implies using cards that you can see from the title, the story cards, the info cards, and the thinking cards. The, the way you use cards is the same in all the phases. The only difference is that in different phases, you have different cards where that have different kind of content. In the, the story cards are talking about quantum technologies in daily life, info cards are concepts about quantum physics, thinking cards are, are open problems about the relationship between society and science. And at the end, the final phase, the, at each group must reach a decision about how many resources should they commit to quantum technology. So let's start with the story cards. Story cards are stories from fictional characters, but they have name and surname that explain how quantum physics and technologies are already in our daily life. But since I think, but also, I mean, we think in the outage team of ICFO that the best way to learn the decide game and to understand what it is, is to try it out. We thought that it could be like a good moment, a good way to learn about it uh, by trying it out yourself. So the idea now is that you will be divided into breakout rooms. So I, I will enter quickly into the breakout rooms and drop you some links in the chat. Then you will have to talk between the participants in the breakout room and choose each one a different link. This is very important because in the I said it before, in the decide games, each participant must have different information to make to make sense. So please, I will drop like a list of uh, four or five links into, into the chat and talk. The first thing you have to do when you are in the breakout rooms is to talk to each other and decide which link is taking which person. And don't take the same link, please. And then what you have to do is to read the first three cards. They, are, they have all the word story cards and they have blue background like this slide. You, first thing, you read them individually. And then you comment one, you choose one, and you tell them, I mean, you, you tell the content to the other people in the breakout rooms. So as a summary, you enter the breakout room, you choose one of the link, talking with your peers, then you read individually the first three cards with a blue background, and then you choose just one to comment it to the other people. This will take approximately 10 to 15 minutes. So. I will leave you there in the breakout rooms. I will send you messages to, remem to remind you how much time you have left. And then we will meet you. We will meet all again here in the, in the main room. So just give me one second so that I can um, divide you in the breakout rooms. Remember that if you have any problems there in, in the breakout rooms, there is like a, an icon with a question mark that is on the top left. And there you can uh, reach out the technical host that can help you in case you have any problem. OK, so just give me one sec to set up the, the breakout rooms. And OK, like this. Uh, OK, so see you in, uh, in like 10, 15 minutes. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So I, I, what, what we understood is that we have to um, live ourselves into a persona and we discuss that a bit and that's about it, right? Or should we, should we do more? Uh, yeah, just choose one and share the information about the others. 
uh, yes, with the course. others. Yeah, you have already yes. finished? Yes, but I think we, first it was fairly clear. Our, our okay. roles was, our roles are fairly clear. Cool. So the idea yeah, was just to have a, cha a taste of what what it is like. So just uh -huh. give me one second so I can tell. Also, I guess the others also uh, will be yes, about yes. to finish. So I will send an announcement that in a minute I will close the room so they won't be too much to worry about their coming back. But yeah, the idea was like just to let you try what it is because I think it's a lot easier to understand than, I mean, we won't do it for all the cards because there's no time, but just to, at least you now have the experience of the dynamics of the activity. Then, then it repeats like this for all the kind of cards. I'm very impressed so far. I'm very impressed. I like it a lot. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. I'm so happy. Okay, I'm about to close the rooms. And I guess we're coming back. Okay, no, like 30 seconds or something. There's always some waiting with the breakout rooms. But the cool thing is that we can do it also online, right, like this. Okay, I think we all came back from the breakout rooms and I hope you, you had a taste and, un, and understood more or less what it's like to, to do the, the first part of the Decide game. If you have any questions, please drop them in the chat or open the mic and, and ask it and I, I will try to answer them as we go. So, and if you don't have any questions, I will go, I will go on and tell you like how, how the this side game goes on. So you, you have tasted like the first part, you have read the story cards and shared with the other participants. And then if you were in a real this side game, but this is like more an explanation of the this side game, so we won't do all the phases, you will go on to experience the info cards. The info cards are information cards. Again, they have more or less the same length of the story cards. So we try to keep them simple and short because again, they are aimed not to experts of quantum physics, but to people who are getting uh, the first steps into quantum physics. But we are trying to introduce in these cards, it's very challenging to <laughs> condense things about basic concepts of quantum physics, like entanglement, measurement, tunnel effect, all these kind of things, or also examples of applications of these concepts, like in the quantum technologies of the first quantum revolution, for example, the MRI scanners, or also the new emerging quantum technologies like sensors, communications, computing, and simulations. All of this in the same format that you've seen. Now that you have the link, then later you can go scroll down and have a taste, for example, of the info cards that you had in your link. But we won't do it now because then there won't be time. But the dynamics is exactly the same. So people read, individually their cards, and then they choose a couple this time because they are more important for us. There are more con concepts inside. So we let them choose two cards and let them share with the rest of the groups. And this, since there's more work to do, we leave them a little bit more time, like 15 minutes usually. And then you go oops, to the thinking card. Again, you can find uh, some example at the end of your link. They are the one with the orange background. And these are like all end with an open question. They are discussion topics. They are not really facts the, differently from the other ones. And they are about the relations between science and society. That's, that's a very nice part because here is where people that maybe were a little bit skeptical at the beginning because they are this kind of people, students or people in general who are not really 
are happy, let's say, about science, this is the part where they engage more because these are really open problems that are also societal problems, like, for example, and also kind of a philosophical questions, like, why do perceive quantum physics as difficult? Or is it possible to judge the future of impact, emer the future impact of emerging technologies? This is in general, like, I don't know if you asked, they asked, for example, the IBM director, I think, in the in the 50s, like, or 60s, I don't remember exactly, like what he thought was the future of computers. And he said that they really didn't think, I mean, the IBM director didn't think that the, the computer were something that, that were going to be of really common use. They were be going to be some very, very special apparatus. And now we know that we have them all in our houses. So even people that are very expert, it, for them, it's difficult to judge the future impact of emerging technology. And this is like one of the discussion points, example of discussion points that are present in the thinking cards. So again, for this phase, they have different, each participant has different cards and they just have to choose one and sh share it with the rest of participants. So you can see that during the whole part of activities, people are continuously talking with each other. So it's something that is really engaging and they cannot get bored because they have continuously to go and talk to their to their peers and then at the end they have to come as uh, to do a decision as i said before no because this is a decide game we have to decide again it's a collaborative game there's no competition we don't have to nobody wins but we have to collaborate uh, with each other to take a decision uh, one thing that we make very clear is that time and resources are limited as in real life so they have to decision to make this decision to allocate resources to quantum technologies, knowing now with all the activities that we've done before that can bring very nice advantages to society at large. And so the question is, how many resources would you commit to developing quantum technologies? Remind them that this is not an individual decision. They have to reach an agreement among the group and that we remind them always that there is no right or wrong answer. And so the idea, we, we provide them with four options. One is the, you can find them also at the end of your link. So if you want to look at them like uh, more thoroughly, but in summary, one is to say, one option would be saying quantum technologies are the future. We must put all the resources that we can to advance as fast as possible. Uh, to, to reach and apply quantum technologies in our life. That's the first one. And I guess most of you, since you are in the UKTC, would choose this one. But th there are also other possible decisions that it's quantum technologies are still too far away. People may think that this is cool, but there is still a lot of work to do. And there are still other things that we, other fields of science that can advance. And though, so maybe we, we put something, but not too much in it. And then there is another opinion that is we should prior, prioritize. There are many problems in the world, like for example, the pandemics or climate change or whatever you may think is more important than quantum technology. And so maybe we shouldn't put too much money in that because there are any, many other urgent issues to care about before in the like um, short term. And then another, Opinion is we should boost basic science. So, okay, quantum technology are very promising, but we know that to advance in technology, you first have to have very, very nice foundation. So first we should put more money in there. And then later when we have a nice foundation, quantum technologies will arise, let's say naturally. So they are, you can see four different opinions. They can all have valid arguments. And, and that's the main point of the decide game. Also in the other version that we have developed, we have also one related to equipment photonics and the other one related to climate change. In all of them, they have, we have four options that are equally valuable. And, and that's like the fun of it, that each group reaches a different decision because like people are like this, we all have this, we live in the same world, we see the same things, but then we have different opinions and different priorities in general. And that's the, the, like the, the beauty of this activity that again involves uh, in this part, uh, again, transversal skills that are very appealing again for, uh, for teachers, for example, that maybe 
for other activity that you may think about, they may be reluctant to introduce them into their um, their day-to-day -day activities because quantum physics is not in the curriculum right now. So they don't they can't lose time talking about things that they are not in the curriculum. But still, this activity is very valuable to them because it's introducing um, competencies. At least in Spain, uh, we we have not only uh, contents in the curriculum, but also competencies, and these are competencies, so skills in general. So in this case, we have discussion that must be respectful and rational, because they have to reach an agreement in the end, and also again communication skills, because at the end of the decision, when they reach a decision, which we we ask the participant to choose a spokesperson and to share their decision with the rest of the groups that are there. So as you can see, it's a, it's a nice and engaging activities. We have tried it with different groups of age. We, we have seen that it works best starting with more mature people, at least 14 years old. So it's high school students. We don't recommend it for primary school, school students because it, it for them, it, like all the structure and and keeping the concentration and also the discussion part, it's a little bit too, let's say, advanced. But for teenager and up, it's it's very nice, and they they all get involved. And also, we tried with people that we tried with people that were engaged by the science teacher. We also we tried with the groups the like that were not really attracted to science as a beginning, but they then enjoyed it anyway. And also we tried in different environments, not only schools, as I said, because schools are, of course, important, but also people, society at large is important. And so we tried also with group of adults, like, for example, in museums, the photos that you see here is actually a photo of, the, of an activity that we did in a museum, as an art museum, the contemporary, uh, the CSCB in Barcelona, they did like a contemporary art museum that had an exhibit running at the time of... Um, uh, pieces of art that were uh, born from uh, artistic residences of CERN. So the exhibit was called Quantica, and there, there was uh, it was curated. So there were a lot of contents about quantum physics. And as uh, we were invited to to do some satellite events like the Decide Game, where people that were going to see the exhibit were just joined our activity before going to see the exhibit and it was like a nice way to introduce them to quantum sciences and technology before entering this artistic uh, interpretation of it. And we did it also in libraries and we're doing it online right now because it's difficult to get together uh, with many people right now. But as you can see, you can easily do it also online because it's a very, very flexible tool. As I, as I said, we can do it in person online because you can do it with physical cards, as, you, as you've seen in this photo here, or you can do it with the cards already online. We have these links where we have already shuffled the cards. So it's more or less as you have your own deck already in your hand. And, and also it's scalable because participants work in small groups. So you can easily do one workshop for 10 people or for 50, more or less the, the work is the same. For a very, very large group, you, you need uh, more moderators because then it's uh, really too many groups to, to kick, take care of. But for 10 to 50, to 50 people, one person can do it easily. And we're doing it also, as I said, online. And for schools, what we do is that we add the, the, the extra value that is talking to a researcher also during the process. So we add like a phase that it's meet the expert where they can meet online with uh, one of our scientists and chat with him or her about their work and what it means to be a scientist and, and so on and so forth. Of course. And, and that is more or less what I wanted to tell you about. And yeah, you can find it online in the in our website that is outreach.icfo.eu in the part of resources for teachers. And also you can contact me and the rest of the team at outreach.edicfo.eu outreach in case you have any questions. And also you can find us in social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook as Icfonians. And also I see that Hank has some questions. Do you want to just open your mic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it was it was on the on the mechanism of the game, yeah. actually. And so we, we, we set apart in, uh, in, in uh, rooms and we discussed it a bit. And we 
um, well, we are all part of uh, a group that uh, that well definitely needed funding. But is there in the game uh, also um, uh, a counter role? I, I mean, I like the collaborative part, but mm -hmm. if we on ourselves decide, uh, well, we need money for this, <laughs> mm -hmm. we end up with a lot of money. Uh, but is there also a counterpart? Like, for instance, there's a limited budget or there's a, there's also a budget claim of healthcare or something like that. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, we don't, we don't really say how much money or it's not really defined. Yeah. But we, yeah, we, we say before they have to go deciding, they have to take into account that, they are, they, that the budget is limited, as always. In real life, budget is always limited. And also time is limited, like in, as in calls for a European project and something like this, you have to do something with this amount of money in this amount of time. So more or less thinking the, this kind of uh, constraint. We don't give like definite constraint because also they don't maybe have the idea of what you can achieve in five years or 10 years. So we don't say how many years, but we say that they have limited amount of money in the sh and think about in the short term. And then we leave mm -hmm. it more or less open to what is for them short term or long or, uh, or the, the amount of money. But, but yeah, we, we remind them that there are limits because this is really important. Interesting, because that makes it more like a, a brainstorm. Uh, it, it's more like a, 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 also a brainstorm in which, you can, uh, in which you are open for this. You don't want to exclude any ideas. You, you exactly. Leave it very open there. Exactly. We, yeah. we give them the four option because, and we try to make them as diverse as possible. And in the end, many times they end up not deciding or mm -hmm. sometimes they say, I mean, here, the, the option in, in this decide game, the option is more or less how much you put. But like, for example, in the photonics game, we are asking them in which applications for, of photonics you want to put it. And most of, sometimes they came up with creative solution on not choosing one and saying, we put 20% of the budget for health application and 25% of the budget for this. So yeah, I mean, we leave it quite open because we think that the important thing is the, is the discussion and talking about it and being engaged about it, being interested about it. And so, I mean, the result, we leave it as open as possible because for us, the important thing is that in the end, they come out of the design game, knowing something about quantum technologies, but especially being aware that quantum technologies are important for their life, whatever they are going to do in their life afterwards this. But they, they, these are important as like, I don't know, cancer research is important for them anyway. Also quantum technology research, uh, research is important Just, for them. Uh -huh. And that's more or less the idea. I don't know if there are other questions. Let, I, did I answer? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So let me see. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Just also, if I can... Uh -huh. Please, please. I, I, there was some noise. I don't know if you talk. Okay. I see that Olga is saying that she needs some more information to try to play the decide game with the students. I think it's it's okay. I, I mean, here is my contact. So please uh, write me, and maybe we can try to organize a, talk, a chat or or like a small video conference, and I can give you all the details. But I mean, you can already find it in the website. Uh, but also, we, I'm happy to to give you like some more detailed information so that you you are more happy with that. And exactly, Daya is saying that Lydia, that was is my one of my colleagues, in the, that was also in the game. In the today in the workshop said that it can be downloaded and use it, of course, giving proper credit to ICFO because we put a lot of effort in it. Uh, couldn't find how to download the game. The idea is that is in the uh, in the outreach website uh, that is uh, in the resources for teachers part, and then there is a link to download it. But if you have any problems, just write me and I'm happy to share it with you. And okay. Okay, so more or less our other comments. I don't know if you have any, any more questions. If I may say, because yeah. I downloaded what was found in that link and it is only a three page instruction. 
Yes, but in the free page instruction, on the second page, there are the links. There ah, is the paper and okay. digital. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank the you. digital are not available yet because I didn't have time this morning to uh, insert the, the links, but the paper version is already available. And if you, but uh, the thing is that since we are working during December to put already all the Machek Lewenstein quantum schools for teachers, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, we are really putting them online uh, right now. But so maybe if in a few weeks you will find them, but if you wanted to see it now, just write me, drop me an email and I'm happy to share it with you with, with all the things. So Federica, the links that you gave to us in the breakout rooms are practically those who nobody sees yet about, apart from exactly. us, right? Exactly. But they are going to be those cards online. So. Exactly. So okay. the, the things that are already online are the physical cards that you can already print out and cut mm -hmm. it and you have the cards like in the photos that I showed you before or like you can see. see here in the the girls is holding so they are like uh, one fourth of a A4 paper so actually if you there are the instruction of how printed out so they are already front back and they are kind of nice and mm -hmm. and otherwise if you want to do it online or digital because you don't want to use paper which is fine we we are preparing the online version it mm -hmm. would take, we, we, we are doing it during this, this December month. So mm -hmm. I have just one group. Uh, usually we have like four, no, four or five uh, different types of shuffling. So like, let's say six group of links for different groups. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's the same thing that you've seen, you, that you have, you have experienced today. So you have three story cards, four info cards, two thinking cards, and the decision part at the end. Oh, yeah, and Lydia is, uh, is adding to the chat that if you use it and you remember, please let us know how it went. I will try to set up also a feedback form, but if you do it like right now, <laughs> it won't be possible. That was actually my next question because I see that in the in the um, in the design game uh, outline <clears throat> for two hours that you wrote kindly for us. <laughs> we'll be using it. There is also a feedback from teachers group uh, coordinators and feedback from participants. So mm -hmm. it means that you have already collected some and you have yes. some statistics. Yes, about I it. have I have collected it from uh, uh, so this is I have collected it since we are doing the online thing, but it was mm -hmm. mostly for the um, photonics side game so the content is different the dynamics is the same because uh, i said it really briefly but we have other two versions of the decide game one with photonics content dedicated to photonics and ICFO, and one dedicated to climate change and the application of photonics for the climate uh, change and environment and and so on so uh, i have just the testing for the online version of the photonics one Mm. And the response was really good. And also you have the response of the quantum one doing, done online, but with teachers, because we did uh, a pilot of the quantum match at school for teachers uh, this summer as mm -hmm. uh, with Catalan teachers. And also it went very well and they were very happy in general about the school, but also especially of the, because we use the, the quantum decide game as a way to, in, like let's say the first day, they had a, a welcome talk about, from Professor Maciek Lewenstein. And then we just did the decide game without no further explanation. So, and okay. yeah. Hank is asking about being translated the game. Uh, I think it's okay. We, we have it in Catalan and Spanish, but I, I'm guessing that you're, you are in another location. It's not right now online in Catalan and Spanish, but since we are in Catalonia, we, we always provide things in Catalan English and, and so we, we can talk about it and, and see how, how to do it. And I don't know if you have any other questions. Again, otherwise, I'm, I'm very happy to continue this conversation some other moment. So you can just drop me an email. You have here my contact out each at ICFO.eu. And I'm very happy to, to go on and talk with you about this, this side game. Thank you so much for your attention. 
and for your participation. I hope to see Thank you around. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 B